Good evening. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. Thank you for tuning in. Those of you who are tuning in for the first time, a special thank you. This is, a, this is an unusual broadcast, actually, because today is Saturday, and those of you who are familiar with CWS are aware that I only broadcast on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. But in the past few days, I witnessed a phenomenon taking place. I witnessed a digital lynching taking place in cyberspace on Facebook, to be exact. About a day or two ago, Mark Anthony Benchcup reposted an appeal by one of our young brothers, Ronald J. Daniels, appealing to his fellow Guyanese throughout the diaspora for assistance in paying off his student fees or his, law, his, his, his student fees to law school. Um, I remained silent for a little bit as I watched the activity and um, as many people came, in, came on in support of his appeal and then there were those who came on with many disparaging remarks. The reason why I'm having this conversation, this impromptu conversation with this young man today is because I believe that we all have a responsibility to help each other, to empower each other. We speak a lot about the importance of encouraging our young people and empowering them to do better than we have done or we might ever do. Yet there are times when we cannot put aside our differences, our suspicions, and do what is right. I'm not here to defend Ronald Daniels. I want to make that clear. I just want to give him an opportunity to speak about himself and to speak about his circumstances that prompted him to put out this appeal. I think of a, I think of a, I think of a passage in the scripture where there was a mob that was about to stone a woman to death. And the son of a carpenter, Jesus as he's widely known, stood up and asked, he was without sin, cast the first stone in defense of this woman. And I'm not saying that we should be in defense of Ronald J. Daniels. He can defend himself. I've read his posts. He's quite a brilliant and articulate young man. The kind of young people that we should be encouraging to go as far as they can. I know it takes a village. And it is important for those of us who can speak out. Those of us who can facilitate an honest and encouraging discourse to do so. And this is why I am here this evening with Mr. Daniels. I am going to take a short break. It's just one thing. Where he's doing this broadcast from, the brothers in Trinidad, there's some construction going on. So you might hear some loud noises in the background. I believe in a, in a few minutes or so, half hour or so, it may go away. But bear with us. This is important. Thank you for your support. We are back. Those of you joining us for the first time, I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. The young man next to me is Mr. Ronald J. Daniels. Ronald, good evening. Hi, good evening, Colin. And um, thank you for coming on to CWS. It, it really is indeed an honor to have you. I you seem to be losing your Skype. Hold on a second. Okay, Ronald, there's a post by Mark Anthony Benchkop appealing to the diaspora on your behalf that seems to be causing much fanfare. How does that make you feel? So, uh, even before we go there, I just want to say thank you for having me, uh, and I'm mindful that this is uncharacteristic of you to have these impromptu conversations. So I'm humbled that you would entertain me on such short notice. And I want to thank the viewers for tuning in. To answer your question on Selwyn, well, there are actually sentiments 
expressed uh, on what I would loosely term both sides of the divide. There are those positive sentiments and those negative sentiments. And in my humble estimation, I think that there's a common thread running on either side of the divide. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say that I'm not rendered uncomfortable by the negative sentiments. I'm mindful that everyone is entitled to his or her opinions. And I'm one who has always been a firm advocate for freedom of expression. And I cannot know when it's convenient to me seek to curtail those expressions which are, dis which are unfavorable to me. So I'm unconditionally entertaining of those sentiments and I'm not affected by them, so to speak. And as respects the positive sentiments, those who appreciate the sincerity in my plea, that humbles me immensely. And it is really good to see the ordinary folks rally around what they perceive to be a sincere cause. Awesome. Awesome. The, the question I have to ask you, why are you so determined to succeed? As far as my recollection goes, Selwyn, and I have the good fortune of my memory stretching me back since probably about three years old. And I've always been one of those really determined individuals. I've always felt from since my relatively tender years, even before I could comprehend the significance of purpose that you know I was plus to this earth for a larger than life purpose and that conviction is what consistently and persistently drives me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and go ahead, sorry. No 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 you, you finish it. This is your show. You finish. Oh if I may say I perceive that purpose to be one of service to humanity and I'm mindful that some may see that as being vague but you would agree with me Selwyn and I'm sure that our viewers would agree with me too that you know, all of us have special qualities, all of us have talents and you know, my talent is to connect with people, to empathize with the plight of others and to lend myself unconditionally to better the circumstances of others. And as a consequence, I remain, I remain driven. Mm -hmm. What is your current status at law school? I've completed law school, I successfully completed reading for the legal education certificate, which allows a soldier to practice in the Caribbean region. But I would not be able to have that certificate physically in my hand until I liquidate the debt that I have to the law school. Um, you, you have been on that particular post, and I've seen you made um, attempts to, uh, to to respond to, to people, various queries and so on. But what is it you believe that most of us do not know that has not necessarily been said yet? I think that those who have questions about the sincerity of my cause and I'm mindful that And I'm going to really play on the pun here. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful that there is sincerity in their question, in their question in my sincerity. Now, Selwyn and 
here is by extension. I think that the vast majority of Guyanese are unaware of the challenges faced by law students in particular. I find it curious that we are granted loans to complete our LLB degrees at the law school, and that sum adds up to roughly about $900,000. It defies logic to me that if a student has to take a loan to complete his LLB, then that student would somehow find the money to go on to law school, which is considerably more. As I indicated in my post, the fees for Guyanese students at the law school, the, the bare tuition is in the sum of roughly four million of our currency, and you spend approximately that same amount in offsetting accommodation, your, your textbooks and other materials and meals. And it is my perspective, and I think that I speak for several of the Guyanese law students as well, that this fact goes relatively unnoticed. So I can definitely understand why people would be uneasy when a claim or a plea in, in the fashion that I've articulated mine appears presumably out of the blues. You know, it takes, to, to me, it takes tremendous courage to, especially knowing the community we, we come from, to ask for assistance in the way you did. And to me, I'm assuming there must have been doubt and trepidation. How, how did you get past that? I um, have to forgive myself when the construction that is going on in my background is posing some challenge. Can you kind of repeat? That? Sure. How did you get past the, the presumed doubt and trepidation to reach out and ask the way you did? How did you get past the doubt? and fear and reach out to reach out and ask for assistance the way you did no well, actually this is a last resort for me because as i indicated in a later post in my response to some of the queries raised that i entered law school on the financial arrangements that i was optimistic would materialize and I'm confident that my sponsor at the time shared the same conviction but circumstances beyond my control and the control of my sponsor has put me in a peculiar position and you know, I've been doing as best as I can with as little as I've had because I'm no stranger to sacrifices. I'm no stranger to the struggles, but I've explored several private avenues and I've explored those avenues from the perspective of being granted loans which I would happily repay and happily repay with interest because at the end of the day, I'm really and truly not the type of guy who looks for a handout. As far as my recollection goes, I've been a hard worker. I've been one of those really responsible young men. So it is uncharacteristic of me to be looking for a handout. But given the time restriction and my unsuccessful attempts to secure funds otherwise, I've capitalized on this avenue as a last resort. Why do you want to be a, why do you want to be an attorney? Pardon? Why do you want to be an attorney? 
That's that's a long story, Selwyn. Okay. You would not believe that I've actually resisted over the years becoming an attorney at law. Just out of high school, I did a diploma in land surveying, and I subsequently did international relations. Well, I did international relations as a pre-law, then I did civil engineering, and then I did law. Well, my, my real passion is, is politics, and I think that everyone who has been paying any attention to me, whether it be close attention or superficial attention, would have realized that my passion is to make a political contribution to my countrymen. And I'm mindful that most of the political notables have been learned in the law as well. And coming up, I've had good legal examples that I've been exposed to, both who would have pursued politics ultimately and those who would have confined their pursuit in legal arena. So my legal pursuit is more or less a stepping stone to my political contributions. And for the course of time that I practice as an attorney, I do intend to be one of the leading attorneys in the region. When you think of law, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Fairness, Selwyn. Fairness. I would ask you this question. I want to go into your timeline a little bit. I want to explore sure. who we are looking at today. So can you give us a glimpse into the life of the nine-year-old Ronald, who you were at 16, and who you became at 21? Well, interestingly, it is kind of ironic that you would refer to my life at nine years old. Life for me drastically changed when, when I was midway between eight and nine years old. My, my hero took ill at that time, and my hero is my mom. And I see her as the world's strongest woman. Now, my mom has been ill from then up until now, so life for me as a nine-year-old was not the typical kind of life. I was fast-tracked into the truth, I was fast-tracked into being responsible. And when I went into high school, from my entry to high school, I basically started offsetting the bulk of my abilities while I've been there for my mom. And I've maintained from then to now that primary responsibility for the care of my mom. Now at 16, that is another important timeline. At 16, I actually took exclusive responsibility for the welfare of my mom and to some extent for my own welfare, though I, I had to some extent a support system from the women who I grew up with. And I grew up primarily with, with women and really strong women too, beginning with my grandma, my sisters, and my aunts. But like, like, like I've indicated to you, 16 was basically another climax in my life. And at 21, at 21, I was putting pen to paper, doing a host of poetry, because that was my avenue to deal with some of the challenges I faced from my 10 years. 
I basically deposited my soul, so to speak, in, in poetry, which I subsequently shared on my timeline from time to time. Do, do, you, do you recall any special words of wisdom that you receive from your, from your mom that have continued to shape who you, 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 you are? One of the things my mom has consistently said to me, and actually I'm the last child for my mom, and I'm the only boy for my mom. I have two older sisters on my mother's side. And getting a son for my mother was a really big thing. She was you know, extremely proud of me from a relatively tender age, and I, I stood out as a child. I was relatively intelligent as a child, so I guess that kind of tipped the scale in my favor too. And that pride that my mother has always invested in me, that has been a consistent source of strength for me because it reinforces in me that my actions, my commitment, my drive makes a mother proud. And I'm quite certain that such affirmation is the affirmation even as adults, even as adults we look for from our parents. See. Um what would you say is one of your fondest memory of your mom? One of my fondest memories of my mom is being taken out by her. She would take me out on, on a regular. I remember this particular time I had what, what we in Guyana call a hard bonds. And I was especially fond of my heart pawns as a child and I remember this one time I was crying behind my mom and she decided to talk me along with her and I said to her, oh, Mom, you know, I want to put on my heart pawns. I, 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 I didn't say heart pawns, I say heart pawns. I think I was probably about five years old then. And she took me out and we, we had a grand time as, as normal, but you know what really struck me, and I'm certain that it, it has happened several times during my infancy and childhood, you know, but I remember the patience that she demonstrated on that particular occasion, and though she was already dressed and ready to go, she still waited for me and tapped me along with her. So, 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 um, your mom was quite is quite patient. She has she has been quite patient with me. In the chat room, Sam said, Sam asked, when you say you have a passion for politics, don't you really mean people? Well, one cannot speak about politics without speaking about the people because. Politics is not disconnected from the people. The, the people are part and parcel of our political realities. And the people are who are supposed to inform and shape our political realities. So my fundamental interest is to basically be part and parcel of that movement that serves as the vessel through which the people's concerns are channeled. Talk about the people's talk about the people's concerns. Let's talk about human rights a little bit, your your passion for human rights. About when do you believe you were forced introduced to the idea and responsibility of human rights? Well, coming up in the circumstances, I've come up in Selwyn. 
you know, one is always mindful of the raw human realities. One gets a look of life from the bottom upwards and not from the top downwards. And when one looks at life from the bottom upwards, in my humble view, you know, one gets an image that is not obscured. And being subjected to the conditions which I've been subjected to, and I, I always felt as though I must lend myself to the service of humanity so that my conditions are not multiplied in the lives of others. And I'm mindful as a single human being standing on his own, there is only so much and so little that I can do. That is why I fancy myself as part of that movement which affects the changes that we need. So to identify a specific, a specific time where I would have been drawn into the cause of humanity, I would be hard-pressed to do so. Because as far as for as far back as my memory goes, I've always been mindful of the plight of humanity, and I've always been persuaded of my purpose to serve humanity. What is the least? What would you say is the least helpful advice anyone has given you, and, and how did that motivate you? Well, I'm not sure that. I can say honestly that anyone has given me unhelpful advice or that I've received any advice extended to me as unhelpful. Those who've been, those who've been exposed to me see in me an unwavering passion and an unwavering commitment. And oftentimes people say, Things to me, people are very generous in in their sentiments about me. That you know, I in turn have to don't play those sentiments because I don't want you know people to be building out of me a monument that does not accord with with reality. And, you know, I've, I've taken those generous sentiments and they've, they've fueled my mobility. But to say that I can't recall, and this is not to suggest that people don't have negative things to say about me. I'm far from perfect, and, you know, I've said... To very many people on very many occasions, I probably have more flaws than the average human being. But I have not committed to memory or have not been affected by any negative sentiment that I can presently recall. Ronald, tell us about your academic trajectory or path from the University of Guyana to the U. Wooding Law School? Well, interestingly enough, um, as I indicated to you, I did international relations as my pre-law and I was misinformed about the procedure to get into, into the law department, so I was forced to take a year's leave from the University of Guyana and having a diploma in land surveying, I capitalized on that and was exempted from the first year of the diploma for civil engineering. So I did the final year in civil engineering and was successful. And then I returned to the University of Ghana to read for my law degree. Excuse me. Having successfully completed my law degree and being on the list of the students to gain an automatic entry 
into the U.S. in law school, I was, of course, to some extent prejudiced by my financial circumstances because even while I attended the University of Guyana, I did several odd jobs to offset my responsibilities. And when I completed the University of Guyana, an acquaintance that I made in, in Belize, you know, I promised to offset my expenses for law school, and that was in 2008. So upon that undertaking, I traveled to Trinidad and became enrolled in the LEC program. But unfortunately, and you know, I, I repeat this with a heavy heart, my sponsor, or my, my prospective sponsor at the time, son got kidnapped and was unfortunately killed and a lot of money was expended in his recovery. So as a consequence, the assistance that had been promised to me for law school had to be withdrawn. So I too was forced to withdraw from law school in 2008. I Remained in, in Trinidad in 2000 and in 2008, and I worked up to 2009, in which I got an automatic reentry into law school, which too I take for granted was unprecedented at the time. And it, again, unfortunately, my circumstances were not favorable to my entry in law school at that time. I returned home in 2010, and again, I resumed my former odd jobs while I persisted in seeking honorable employment. Not that you know, I, I perceive my odd jobs to be dishonorable, because as far as I'm concerned, they helped to shape my character and were basically a stepping stone to project me into the future that I envision. In 2010, I got a job at one of the leading law firms and I worked there up to 2012 when I left to attend law school for the second time. Mm. So that basically maps my journey from the University of Guyana to the UODN Law School. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your current circumstances. Sure. You have an audience. I know that you have written extensively, you've, you've written um, comprehensively on this matter, but Here's an opportunity for you to tell the audience what your circumstances is and what you are looking for. Well, as, I, as I've indicated in the plea that I put out there, as it stands, I'm indebted to the law school in the sum of 26,500 Trinidadian currency. Well, that has been slightly reduced by some contributions I've received since my plea, some contributions which I'm unconditionally grateful for. And as I have indicated, unless that sum is liquidated, then I would not be permitted to graduate from law school. And the consequence of that, that I would not be called to the bar. Within, within the timeline to be called to the bar here, as, as far as I'm aware, we, we don't have a timeline to be called to the bar in Guyana, and I stand to be corrected on that, but there's a timeline to be called to the bar 
in Trinidad and Tobago. And as I'm here, I intend to capitalize on being called to the bar before that timeline expires and subsequently to be called to the bar at home in Guyana. Is, what, is, what, what is one misconception that you would like to address that you have seen on Facebook that you would like to address at this moment? Well, I think that the, the misconception is that my plea is somehow a scam of some sort. And, you know, I, I cannot help but smile at that because those who know me personally and those who have been following my presence on Facebook for the past um, few years would, would have detected that I'm not the sort of individual to lend myself to any dishonest practice, to subscribe to or endorse any dishonest practice, because at the end of the day, I have my integrity and my dignity to preserve. And the part that I'm going down, one, one cannot help but be cognizant of the implications of a lack of integrity of a lack of integrity of any individual who engages similar pursuit. So I say categorically, there is absolutely no truth in the sentiment that my plea for assistance is insincere and every claim that I've made publicly can be substantiated. Are you surprised by this reac reaction from your own, your fellow Guyanese? No, I'm not. I'm not surprised by the reaction. And when I say I'm not surprised by the reaction, I use that as a blanket remark. I'm not surprised by the positive or the negative reaction because. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that the people out there of different persuasions, different mentalities, different perceptions, different inclinations, and people who are susceptible to different influences. So one who is in tune with human nature and human inclinations and human frailty would not be surprised by either, either category of the sentiments expressed. I want to I want to read a quote by um, Dr. Martin Luther King. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. You have a passion for helping people. Yes. Where do you believe that comes from, and why is it so important to you? I think my, my passion for helping people is, is influenced primarily by what I perceive to be my purpose in this life. And as I've indicated earlier, before I could have appreciated the significance of what purpose means, I've always felt within the fabric of my being within every fiber of my person that, you know, I, 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 I am in this world for a larger than life purpose. And despite my, my childish years, I've, I've always demonstrated a maturity that was not in accord with my years. And the maturity at that time you know, cause me to feel as though, you know, I'm, 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 I'm here to serve, despite the fact that, you know, I asked me then, I would not have been in a position to articulate persuasively what, what I felt at the time. 
But my passion to serve in humanity has been catalyzed by the things I've seen on my journey thus far. And, you know, I say to my, my friends especially that, you know, I've seen life in many shades of black and gray. And, you know, if one were to become exposed to the contents of my life and the graphic realities which form the pillars upon which I stand, then, you know, one would be so surprised that, you know, I, I'm standing, I'm sitting here with my sanity intact and my focus not real. So, my, my conclusive response to that question is that, is that my passion to serve humanity is informed by humanity itself. And when one looks at humanity and one is not moved to feel some, some sort of sympathy for the current state of humanity, then one ought to look internally. In the chat room, Sam asked, what is the timeline? Pardon? Sam asked in the chat room, what is the timeline? What is the timeline for what? I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm wondering if I missed something in the um, on Facebook that I'm not privy to. I, if I may be presumptuous and assume he means the timeline for you to pay off your, your outstanding debt. The timeline for me to pay off my outstanding debt is the end of this month. The end of this month? Yes, actually that timeline has been a, a rotating timeline, so to speak, because you know, I, I, I've been given different deadlines by the university by which that payment should be made. And, and I fancy the ultimate deadline to be the end of the month as, as the graduation is slated for the 4th of October. Mm. Um, I just want to make a, an, an announcement that I'm surprised that there aren't more questions and comments in the chat room. I made a sacrifice and invited you to appear so that those who are concerned about the validity of what you were saying and want to question your integrity would seize this opportunity to join us in this conversation and make their, their concerns known or ask questions. But anyway, let, let's proceed. Can you take us back in time and, and introduce us to someone who you admired and look up to and who would have influenced the young man we are coming to know as Ronald James, Ronald Daniels? I've had very many influences, but one of the influences which certainly stands out is Professor Bishop, that's Professor Aubrey Bishop, who is one of our notable Chancellor and Chief Justices. Now, actually, my introduction to Professor Bishop was not a generous one. Uh, at the time I was introduced to Professor Bishop, I had some difficulties with one of the lecturers over an assignment. That difficulty was subsequently resolved and the lecturer and I became friends. But I've always been one of those really stand-up guys and I'm never hesitant to stand up for myself or to stand up for others. And I remember Professor Bishop saying to me, sitting across the table, he said to me that, 
young man, you have you have a lot of passion in you. You have enormous potential, but unless you rid yourself of that passion, then it would hamper you in life. And I was really moved by what he said, and what he said plunged me into introspection. And I really searched myself, and I saw the wisdom in what he said, and I decided to engage that journey of ridding myself of you know, any, any anchor, any anchorage that I had at the time. Subsequently, Professor, Professor Bishop and I became, we became friends. I would frequent his office and we would sit and talk for hours upon hours. And our, 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 our conversations centered around Fred Wills um, predominantly because Professor Bishop harbored an abiding passion, an abiding admiration for Fred Wills. So he would talk to me lengthily about Fred Wills. I remember, I remember him saying to me once that just above the stairs in his, in his home, he had a photograph of Fred Wills and his wife and him would often get into debates about the photograph. And in his office, just above his, just above his, his chair, there was a photograph of Fred, Fred Wills. So anytime I went into Professor Bishop's office, I was always looking at him and Fred Wills as we converse. And Professor Bishop added much, much gems to the stock of my knowledge and is a man that I grew to admire and is one that, you know, one can easily want to emulate. And in addition to compounding my interest in the law, you know, is 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 he also set me on the course to look into the profiles of some of our local notables. So I must say that um, Professor Bishop has had a significant influence on um, molding me to the man that I am today. And I take it for granted that very many law students who would have had the coveted honor and privilege of being a student of his would subscribe to my sentiments in this regard. All right, I'm, I will take a short break. And um, before I go, Sam just asked a question which I think you answered eloquently, but I, I don't want to presume that that is the only person. Sam asked, outside of your mom, whom you spoke of, and your immediate family, which human being has inspired you the most? Would that be Professor Bishop? That would be that would be Professor Bishop locally, mm -hmm. but I've been in tune with. I'm a sucker for reading, and my aunt especially has cultivated in me that habit of reading. I was always more inclined to calculations, and I remember my aunt impressing upon me to read and read and read and read. And I think that that has become more or less an affliction for me because I read virtually any and everything. Well, let, uh, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I want to ask you a favor. I want you to use that same courage you used to appeal to, uh, to the diaspora, to show us your whole face. Sure. I, you, you understand? I want the people to see who Ronald J. Daniels is. So you got to move your hands away from the face. Sure. <laughs> and um, when we come back, the question I want to ask you, just, just give us a brief 
um, glimpse about your your daughter is it? your daughter right pardon your daughter you have a daughter yes I do. right when we come, I see you light up right away all right let's <laughs> take let's take a short break sure We are back with the eloquent Ronald J. Daniels. Ronald, the question I ask you for, tell us a little bit about your daughter. And Look, you light up every time I, I mention her. So, um, if, if one were to take a look at my Facebook timeline, then you would see it tattooed with <laughs> images of my daughter and conversations I would have with my daughter and I'm I'm never sparing in the expressions of my affections for my daughter. My daughter is is the nucleus of my life, so to speak. And you now despite the fact that I've grown up with a sense of responsibility, I I think that when my daughter was born, that, uh, that tempered me in so many different regards. You know, I, I felt that responsibility for, for another life. I, I felt, you know, having contributed to the existence of another life. And from the time my daughter was born, we've been extremely, extremely close. So much so that people would refer to her as my shadow because anywhere you see me, you see my daughter. <laughs> and you know, only, only a few days ago, she was asking me, she was saying, Daddy, and when I was small, I, I was always behind you, you know? She was like my, well, she has an older sister, and you know, she's like, you know, my older sister, she was always behind mommy, and you know, I was always behind you, I was always, you know, really close to you, and you know, my, my, my daughter and I have a bond that is, is really indescribable. You know, you... You have to be in our presence to experience it, to fully appreciate how, how deep it is, because I don't think that any expression of mine, any combination of words, no matter how eloquent or articulate, would render justice to the nature of the relationship I share with Samaya. <laughs> Any advice for other young men pursuing um, the same career path? Pardon? Any advice for for other young men that are, that want to pursue the same career path? Well, I think that first and foremost, you know, one must be sure of what one really wants from life, because our choice of career may not necessarily align with our purpose and I think that we should always be informed by what our purpose is. And I remember a few years ago coming across a benchmark to gauge what one's purpose is and it asks the question, what would you do for the rest of your life without any financial gain from it? And I think that if one can sincerely answer that question, then one would be informed of what his or her purpose is, and one can align his career path to be in harmony with that purpose. But to zoom in specifically to your question, Selwyn, my advice to any person, be it 
a young man or a young lady or a man who's advanced in age or a woman who is advanced in age and want to pursue to pursue love, that person has to be prepared to work really hard. You know, I've heard that the law requires a special type of brain and you know it it, it may seem a bit pompous to express that sentiment. But um, those who those who venture into law would soon appreciate that law requires a special type of commitment. And there is the saying that the law is a jealous mistress. And indeed the law is a jealous mistress. It's 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 an amalgam of a jealous mistress, a jealous wife, and a jealous combination of everything which competes for one's attention. <laughs> so one has to be prepared to lend themselves fully to the study of the law if one intends to be successful and one intends to be competent in the practice of the law, especially given the fact that the profession is becoming as crowded as it is. Ronald, why are you so positive? Where does it, why are you so positive? Where does it come from? People ask me that all the time. I, I have a cousin who, who spares an opportunity to say to me, you know, how can you be as cool and calm as you usually are when it appears that your world is falling apart? And... You know, she, she looks upon me with a mixture of curiosity and pity. <laughs> and, you know, I will say to you what I've said to her and what I've said to everyone else who have asked me that, is that there's absolutely no benefit in indulging in negativity. There's absolutely no benefit in inviting negative things into one's life. I mean, our circumstances without our intervention can be really negative. So we don't need to contribute to that negativity by cultivating it internally. And I live by a simple maxim, Selwyn, and that maxim is, life is the moment and irrespective of whether those moments are glorious or those moments have the effect of bringing one to his knees, those moments soon disappear. Like the moment we're having here, before we know it, this moment too will disappear. So my practice is all being to not, not be hampered by those negative moments and not be haughty by the positive by by the generous moments. If you had to do this over again, would you make a similar appeal? Pardon? If you had to do it over again, would you make an appeal as you have for assistance? I'm going to say this unapologetically that I've always been one to do bold things. I've always been one to, to push the limits both positively and negatively. And as I've said in one of my posts today, no one should feel embarrassed by the financial circumstances if one is sincere in his pursuit of advancement and in his pursuit of excellence because our financial circumstances may be the consequences of the forces which are beyond our control and should one not be ambitious enough, should not want should, should one not dare to dream because of the impediment of Finances, I, I, I think not. And I would not power in the face of my circumstances. 
And if I had to relive the moments I've relived to get me here, and I have to face them under these same circumstances, then I would not be hesitant when I feel that time is right to make the public plea as I did. Ronald, well, can I ask you a favor? I would like you to I would like you to write this statement on your wall. I will not cower. This is your, these are your words. I will not cower in front of my or before my circumstances. It is they are, it is a very profound statement and I think it should be um, I think it should be posted and I I think every young person man or woman should read that especially when they're at the crossroads of doubt fear and a desire to move on i think those are very important words and i think you should you should write it i'm asking you to write it and put it up on your wall it's important i want to know though why do you continue um let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. This courage that you have, Ronald, it is unusual in the, the Guyanese ethos. It's, it's, it's very unusual. And you speak unashamedly. I, quite frankly, I don't say anything to be ashamed of. But I admire your courage. I think it is very important. I think that there needs to be a paradigm shift in our culture on how we treat each other. We speak a lot about love. We speak about compassion. But I think it needs to be more than words. It needs to be more, more about doing than saying. I feel honored and humbled by what I saw. I think it was yesterday when Mark posted it. I never met you before, I never spoke to you before, but as I said in my opening remarks, I couldn't remain silent. I think I would have been doing myself and other people a disservice if I had the means to give you an opportunity to address this particular situation and answer any questions that anyone might have and, and remain silent. I think when they're in, in the presence of a mob, or potential violence. It is not those who scream and shout that we must fear the most, but those who remain silent. And so I am I am glad that Mark Benchkop, well, I you know, Mark has Mark has tremendous amount of courage. And I applaud him for what he does. But for him to take up this charge and to present it and to defend you. And others have also defended you. Not that you need any defending. I know you're quite capable of doing that. I don't want to go on with any sort of ranting. Oh, no, you are. You are. And, 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 and I want to say this. I want to say this. Take this opportunity to say this. That if you're any indication of some of the young people that are in Guyana today, who we hardly know of because they don't necessarily have a voice, I am... I am encouraged and hopeful what Guyana is going to become in future years. I applaud you on your journey and what you're doing. I just want to ask you a few more questions, Ronald. I, I, I find what is happening here tonight very fascinating because this is something I will not do. I would not have done, let me, let me say that. I would not have done. But as I said, I was compelled to speak up or give you an opportunity to speak. Martin Luther King again said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. What are, the most, what are you most hopeful for in your pursuit of a law degree? So before I answer that, I, I wish to say that Mark Benchkop is one of those few persons who is shorter than I am, that I look up to, <laughs> I, I know it's a mathematical impossibility. 
<laughs> sorry, I, I sorry that that was so eloquent. So. <laughs> sorry about that. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, but I really do admire Mark's courage. Mark's courage is is unparalleled, especially with the risk he exposes himself to by standing up as he does on the issues which are pertinent to Guyanese society. Mm -hmm. And I take it for granted to the region by extension. And I would just like to comment quickly on the quotation you read just now about infinite disappointment. I beg to differ. I don't think that there is any such thing as infinite disappointment. One, one only not, not infinite disappointment, disappointment. finite disappointment. When he dares to stop dreaming, when he dares to, to stop pursuing that which drives him. And too often times we see setbacks at, as disappointments and we treat them as finite. And that is where dreams die a thousand deaths. So I'm really at variance with that part of the quotation. No, no, in, in, in let, let us let us let us revisit this historical statement and Dr. King. What he said was finite disappointment, not infinite disappointment. Finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. That's what he said. You want me to read it back? I'm really Selvin, sorry. I know, I, I noticed that your your connection is getting getting poor. Dr. King said we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Not infinite disappointment. I think you misheard me there. But anyway, I get your point though, because you made even in mis um misunderstanding what I said, or mishearing what I said, you made a very valid and profound point, as usual. So I am, I am eager to see several years from now. Thank you, sir. You are, you, you are quite welcome. I am really eager to see you, my brother, in, in court or wherever you choose to defend <laughs> our people or defend our citizens. I, I can't wait. I must ask you this, though. What sure. is it about what you do that feeds your spirit? Pardon? What is it about your career? What is it about what you do, your pursuit of this law degree that feeds your spirit? So, um, I see my law degree as a tool, as a tool of service, as a tool of service and as a tool for service. And Putting myself in a position where I can be a tangible voice for those who need it, then it would make manifest my service to humanity. Mm -hmm. And you know, one must consistently advance advance himself from the perspective of of being prepared to lend himself to service and not having that law degree would restrict not my not my capacity it would restrict my, my my capacity though not my capabilities because I cannot stand up in court in the defense of anyone unless I'm called to the bar and whether that defense be paid defense or pro bono defense. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've said to prospective employers from very early on that a reservation I wish to have is to lend my services without cost when that need arises. Awesome. Um, pardon? No, I said awesome. I said yes, on, on, on the society that we live in, I, I see so many people who 
are prejudiced by inadequate legal representation because of their financial realities. You ask me earlier what comes to mind when, when, when I think about the law and I said justice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, unfortunately justice in too many of, excuse me, too many of our third world societies have become, um, has become equated with one's, one's dis, dis, disposition to offset the payment for justice. <laughs> and I'm really rendered uneasy by anyone having a legitimate cause, and that cause cannot be vindicated because of one's financial circumstances and being aware of those myriad realities, I've sought to reserve reserve that liberty from any employer in whose service I, I, I surrender myself to. To have that liberty to stand for those who need someone to stand for them when their financial circumstances cannot buy the justice which they deserve. What are you, what are you most proud of? Pardon? What are you most proud of? In terms of? Anything. What are you most proud of? In terms of your career, your mom, your daughter, whatever. Anything. It would have to. Hmm? I didn't hear you. There's so many things that that I can identify, but if I'm to choose one thing in particular, it would have to be my daughter's development. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of the fine child that she's evolving into. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm really surprised that I'm carrying on the nature of conversations that I do with a seven-year-old. So it would have to be on her maturity at the age she is. Only this morning I said to her that you're really mature, you know. And she asked me, um, Daddy, what does, what does mature mean? And I said to her, um, it means that you really, you really grown and developed for your age. And she smiled. Uh, she, she said to me yesterday, I think it was, that, that I really love you. you know? even, even when you beat me, I still really love you, you know. <laughs> and I mean, a, a parent hearing those things from a seven-year-old child, you know, how, how, can, how can that not be the hallmark and highlight of, of one's life? What what did these circumstances what did you what did these circumstances teach you about yourself? Pardon? What did these circumstances with the with the need for the, um, funding to or need of uh, for assistance to uh, pay off your your outstanding debt? What did these circumstances what did you learn about yourself during this um, process during this process? As I've said before, Selwyn, I'm, I'm no stranger to these circumstances and throughout my journey, mm-hmm. relatives and strangers, friends included, have come to my rescue at my most trying times. Mm-hmm. And I'm always comforted by by my conviction that God has a larger than life purpose for me. And irrespective of what I go through, that purpose would be made manifest. I can remember a few years ago, Selwyn, when my batchmates went on to law school in 2008 and I was forced to withdraw. Someone asked me, 
How do you feel when you look at your batchmates and their practicing attorneys and you are not? And I said to them in all sincerity, I feel really proud of my colleagues and I, I sing their praises because my thing is, is that we all get our chance to make it to the sunrise or to the sunlight, if you may say, but we, we, we would all not make it at the same time. And every setback in my life, I've always seen it as a lesson that God needs to teach me. Maybe some, some fragment of my character that he needs to build for me to be that whole person who can carry out his job of serving humanity. So what I've learned by my present circumstances and the circumstances I've gone through, which are of a similar nature, is that even, even the best falls down sometime and you know one must always be prepared to be humbled when one when one shines and when the spotlight is not off and uh, 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 when the spotlight is off of him as well mm. so more than anything else these have been humbling experiences for me I have. And, and if i may say quickly sure Right, it is consistently recycled. You know, my confidence in humanity, and one must look at humanity from different perspectives, from the perspective of needing assistance that one's talent is disposed to render, and from the perspective of benefiting from the assistance that humanity is disposed to give. If you could go back in time, what would you tell your 16-year-old self? Keep moving forward. When are you most happy? Pardon? When are you most happy? I'm most happy when I'm buried into when I'm buried into a book survey. <laughs> and, and this is not to diminish in any way the happiness which I feel with my family, the happiness which I feel with my friends, and the happiness which I, I derive from my service to humanity. But I interpret your question to mean when am I outside, outside of the scope of my other pursuits and my other commitment most happy? And I'm most happy in that individual way when I'm buried in a book. Finish this sentence for us. I look forward to Sunday evenings too. Pardon? Finish the sentence. I look forward to Sunday evenings too. I look forward to Sunday evenings too. Finish the sentence. To cuddle up with the family. <laughs> um, if I may ask you this before I ask you my last question sure what is your favorite quote to live by what is my favorite quote to live by it would have to be that obstacles are the things we see when we take our eyes off of our goals and but my bro my young brother, do you live by that? Do you actually? I'm I'm not asking a question. I'm making a statement. You actually live by that, from what I'm seeing. And the last question I ask all my guests: What makes you laugh out loud? Different things, so Selin. I'm, I'm I'm a spontaneous type of guy, and I tend to find humor in virtually. Anything I can, I can remember a previous relationship of mine. My my girlfriend at the time told me that 
You know, you're going to laugh your way out of this relationship. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm sorry. I I say to people that I'm, I'm, I'm really and truly an idiot at, at heart, and I know that it's probably a harsh thing to say about oneself, but I like having fun, and, and I like freaking out, I like pulling pranks, and I'm really the down-to-earth, laid-back type of guy, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm all for having fun. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy having you, my, my young brother. Is there anything... You thought we should have covered that we did. Selwyn, the pleasure is definitely mine. And again, I thank you for coming out of your comfort zone to entertain me. And I want to say to our viewers, thanks for taking time out from what must be a busy Saturday afternoon. I know you could be investing that time in so many more productive things to lend your ears and your eyes to this conversation and I hope that it would have dispelled some of the uncertainties and it would have quieted some of the the negative sentiments which are being conveyed about my plea. And you know I, I, I really do encourage you to support to support a good cause and the support does not stop at me because any support of me would be transcended into my support and my service to humanity. Thank you, Ronald Daniels. Thank you. And please don't forget my request. Right? Don't forget my request to write that statement and put it on your wall. I think that's very important. Of course not. And I do, I do so promptly. Let's <laughs> Let's set off my way out of this relationship. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. Well, thank you and good night, my brother. Have a good evening. You too, Selwyn. All thank right. you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.